Well, good morning again, everybody. I am excited today to start a brand new sermon series, our second main uh, sermon series of the fall. And as you saw, the title is Faith IRL. Does anybody know what IRL stands for? Anybody cool and young and hip here? In real life, right? That's, that's what we say online. It's not something that happens. On, it's, this is real life. Well, in this series, IRL refers to this. We're going to talk about faithful living outside of this particular room in our real lives, so to speak. Not that this is not real life, but hey, listen, there's 168 hours in the week. And I'm just asking the question, what about the other hours? What about the 167 hours that we all have between church services? Uh, That's a lot of time. And what's the main thing that we do in that time? Work, right? So we work. What about work? Work is central to our lives. Think about it. We have 24 hours in a day, and eight of that is spent sleeping, so we're down to 16. And what do we do with that 16 hours? A lot of us, we do eight hours of work, plus a lunch at work, that's Nine plus commuting to work, that's 10. And pretty soon you see like the majority of our life for many chapters of our lives is spent working as central to who we are. And by the way, when I say work, I just want to be clear. I define it this way, Jordan Rayner's definition. Anything you do, anytime you expend energy on something in order to achieve a desired result. So if you're a full-time worker, yes, you're a worker. If you're a stay-at-home parent, yes, you're a worker. If you're a student, yeah, you're a worker. Uh, If you're a retiree, guess what? You also fit this definition. So we're all in it together. Work is central to our lives, and we're going to talk about how to glorify God at work. Uh, Even though work is central to our lives, though, I wonder what your experience of work has been like like throughout your life. Um, I want to put this statistic on the screen and see if it resonates with anybody. This is from CNBC recently. Job unhappiness is at a staggering all-time high, according to Gallup, and it quotes a Gallup poll that showed 33% of people are engaged at work. That means two-thirds of people are disengaged at their work. They don't see any meaning in it. They don't see any deep reason to be involved. They just go and they get their paycheck and they go home. And the same study found that 19% of people, almost one in five, say they are, quote, miserable at work. So if you look around, that's a lot of people in this room that might be miserable in their work. And in fact, firsthand, I know that some of you struggle with that. We're going to talk about that in this series. Uh, But let's get beyond statistics. What does that look like? Maybe you resonate with stories better. So I went to Reddit, and I found this great question. Uh, Scored Throwaway asked everybody this question. Hey, does everybody hate their job? I want some really honest answers, because almost nobody I know actually likes their job. My dad is constantly exhausted working in computer engineering, None of my brothers feel passionate or interested in theirs. Is this just the reality of work? This is what we're going to talk about in this series, especially today. Here's some answers. Hot molasses says, I've hated every job I've ever had. Yet every single person I ask say they love theirs. I think they're lying. Let's skip on down here. Oh, wait, here he says, I think there are a few people who like or even love their jobs, and they're the people who follow their passions. Reply, oh no, oh no, I've followed my passion in life, spent 18 years in the restaurant industry, and all I ended up with was bad knees, a big chip on my shoulder, and some substance abuse issues. So (laughs) this person says, even if you follow your passions, working is just hard, and it's not always a great experience. One last comment here, one last reply, Golf1415 says, listen, a job is a fact of life. We have to have it to survive. I don't mind my job, but if someone dropped a bag of money in my lap I could retire on, I'd quit tomorrow. Anybody else silently want to affirm like, we work because we have to, not because we want to. That's why no one enjoys their job. And yes, this is the reality of being an adult. So this series is about this. 
And it's about work and how to glorify God at work and actually how to find enjoyment and meaning in work. So I hope it's going to be super practical and super helpful to you. I want to begin today by exploring whether that mindset is true or not. What about work? Is it a punishment on humanity? Is it an unfortunate necessity? We have to have money to live. That's all there is to work. It's an unfortunate necessity. Or... Is it actually a gift from God, and is it actually a noble calling? Well, I hope you can see where this is headed, right? Uh, I I tend to affirm these, and in fact, not just a calling, but actually a a commission from God. And so part one of our series is about that commission we received from God, our first commission. Uh, So we're going to find that in Genesis chapters one and two in just a second. But before we open the Bible together, would you pray with me? Let's ask God to speak to us today. Well, God, we are so thankful for your word and how you do speak to us. And today, many of us need to hear from you about work. A lot of us have come into this room, frankly, worn out from a week of work. Work that many of us didn't enjoy. Work that some of us were dying to escape. And many of us, God, were tempted to see work as part of the curse. And we think that paradise would be getting rid of it. But help us today to see, God, that in the beginning, you gave us work as a gift. You called humans to work alongside you, with and for you. Sacred work in the ordinary things of life. So God, help us today to see how sacred each of our jobs is, how meaningful they are. So as you speak to us through your word now, God, help us to listen well, help us to understand it, and help us to live it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, we're right in Genesis chapter 1 today. That is super easy to find. So if you're new to the faith, Genesis is the first book in the Bible, and Genesis 1, where we'll start, is the first words in the Bible. I invite you to turn there now, and remember that Genesis is a book all about Beginnings, that's what the word Genesis means, beginnings. It's the book that details the beginning of the world, the beginning of humanity, the beginning of the people of God, the beginning of the redemption story. And so as we turn there, it should be no surprise, the very first key word we encounter, Genesis 1-1, is this, in the beginning. So as we seek to answer this really, really important question about who we are and what role work has in our life and how to work in a way that glorifies God, I think it's great to start at the beginning, where the story starts, and that's what we're going to do today. And one of the key things the Bible says about the beginning is this. It introduces us to God. God, in the beginning, what did he do? He created. He created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. So one of the very first things that we learn about this God that we serve and worship is that he is a creator and that actually he is a, are you ready? A worker. And you look all the way at the bracket of this at the end of chapter one, you get into chapter two, uh, verse uh, two, two, two says, listen, God worked when he made the world. God's a worker. And in fact, the New Testament backs this idea up. Jesus himself said in John 5, 17, uh, in his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. Jesus, God the Father, both of them, they, they're workers. And so I want us just to pause on the very first verse in the Bible to learn this. God's a worker, and so to work is to be like God. Isn't that cool? Uh, have you ever thought of that? It's, it's kind of simple, but it's important to remember God is a worker. And so when we work, that's one way that we are actually godlike, that we're growing in godliness. Uh, but there's another thing we can learn just from this single verse, and that is this. God is good. And everything God does is good. And so that means this. Our good God did the work of creation, so working is good. Because God did it and God is good, that means that working is 
good. Look at all we've learned from just one verse already this morning. All that you can get out of just one verse in the Bible. But let's keep going. And we just read, God created the heavens and the earth. I don't know if you realize this. I, I, I think a lot of people miss this. Really interesting tidbit about creation. Verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. When God created everything, he first created it as this unformed, kind of primordial, formless, shapeless material. When he started, he gave it a process. And that process involved addressing its formlessness and its emptiness. And in fact, we're not going to read all of chapter 1, but if you were to read all of chapter 1, here's what you're going to find. This is so interesting. Um, All of chapter 1, the six days of creation, are addressing the formlessness and the emptiness of creation. It's really interesting. So look at at chapter 1 in summary with me. Day 1, day and night. Day 2, sea and sky. Day 3, land and plants. It's separating and giving form to a formless creation. Day four, sun and moon. Day five, fish and birds. Day six, animals and humans. It's, doing, it's filling those domains. First, God separated out these domains, gave them form, and then he filled them. And there's a correspondence, a really neat correspondence. So he filled day and night with the luminaries, with the lights, He filled the sea and the sky with beings in them, and he filled the land with beings in them, and among other things, us. So God's work was this, filling and forming, forming and filling. I find that really interesting, that God didn't just create everything in a single fell swoop and find it in its final state, but he created in a way that took time and effort. And as we're going to see, as we continue on in the story, Even after all of this, even after all the forming and filling God did, he left a little bit undone still even then and brought humans into the story to finish that work. All right, let's check that out. So let's zoom in right now on day six. So we come toward the end of the story about you and me. And this is where we appear in the creation account, humans. We'll skip on down to verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over the creatures that move along the ground. So day six is a special day, right? When humans appear on the scene, it's different than everything that has come before. What makes humanity different than everything else? Well, it's in this word I've highlighted here that we are created uniquely, it says, in the image of God in a way that no squirrel is and and no cat or dog is, no plant is. We, humans, are created in the image of God. What does that mean? A lot of people say a lot of different things. I prefer just to take my cues from the text itself. So the first thing it says, like, the image of God, what does that look like? First, it looks like this, that we're created in the likeness of God. In some ways, not always, but in many ways, we are like our Father, our God. We bear a resemblance to him. And why do we have that unique likeness? Well, it's for a purpose, and it is so that we can rule like him and rule with him and rule for him. God put humanity in place on earth, formed uniquely in his image and likeness for a reason, and that reason is to rule with and for him. And we're going to see to actually continue the work of forming and filling to continue the work, in some weird sense, of creation. So let, let's, let's expand this even more. If you in your Bible were to flip to Genesis chapter 2, you'll read a second creation account. And this creation account in chapter 2 is similar to chapter 1, but it really focuses on humans. It zooms in and really just talks about the human part of creation. And so I want us to finish today by just looking at one verse from chapter 2 that explores why humans were created the way they were and what role they were given. So Genesis chapter 2, 15, the Lord God 
took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So humanity, day six, the pinnacle of creation, created a, uniquely in the image and likeness of God to rule over everything. God took that humanity and put them in an environment just designed for them and their flourishing. And what did he do? This is really important for our discussion today. What did he do with Adam and Eve when he put them in this garden? Did he say, just enjoy yourself and it's a, it's a vacation 24-7. It's like Club Med out here. We've got unlimited whatever you want. No, actually it's very different. He said, listen, I'm putting you in the garden to do something. I'm commissioning you to do something. And in fact, two things here it says in chapter two, to work it and to take care of it. Humanity at our very creation, at the beginning of our story, we were given by God a commission to partner with him in the world, working it and taking care of it. Uh, abad is the, the Hebrew word here for work it. And you can just imagine, uh, you know, Adam with his fingers dirty. You, you would see Adam and he wouldn't be, he would have like calloused hands. He was a worker. He did things in the garden and he really enjoyed it. He he was working with it. He was developing it. He was making it beautiful, making it functional, and developing it. Uh, and really interesting about this particular Hebrew word is it can be used of agricultural things. It's also the same word that's used in religious contexts. It's also the same way we talk about priests in the temple. Isn't that interesting? So the work that Adam was doing in the dirt with the plants and with the animals, this very secular work, it's the same verb as the priests in the temple serving God, like, like I'm doing now. It's the same thing. <laughs> I mean, here it is, right? Numbers 3, 7 through 8, they, uh, the priests, they are to perform duties for him and for the whole community at the tent of meeting by doing the, there's the word, the work of the tabernacle. They're to take care of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting, fulfilling the obligations of the Israelites by doing the, there it is, the work of the tabernacle. Um, for Adam and Eve, this is the same word. For you, in whatever you're doing, in your nine to five, Monday through Friday, it's the same word. What you're doing and what I'm doing, they're different, but in a sense, they're very, very similar. According to the Bible, if you read it, there's very little wall between sacred and secular, actually. We're all uh, helping God accomplish his mission work. Uh, the other half here is taking care of it. Samar is the Hebrew word there. And it's the, this connotation of like a, a stewardship. God has given us his, his creation. He owns it. It's his. And he has given it to us as stewards of it, to take care of it, to watch after it, to look after its good, to preserve it. Um, it's almost like we are his trustees. He has entrusted it to us. And interestingly enough, this word, it has a lot of dignity attached to it. This is not some menial thing. But look at this. It's actually used of God as well. In the Psalms, you read that the Lord watches over us. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. It's a verb that God himself does to us. God takes care of us. God watches over us. And in turn, he gives us the task of watching over and taking care of what is his, the world. So it's like we're his trustees, it's like we're his stewards. And he gives us this, this calling to work it and to take care of it. Uh, one last word I wanna note in this verse before we move on is this. Where does all of this happen in the story? The working happens in the garden. Right, So if you, if you think that work is a necessary evil, no, there's no evil in the story yet. If you think work is a punishment, no, there's no punishment in the story yet. Work happened in the garden, and the garden, if, this is really interesting, if you look at the, uh, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word the Greek uh, translator has chosen is this, paradise. When God put humans in what he defines as paradise, it's not a vacation, it's a vocation. And so, 
I want you to see, if nothing else today, this. That work was part of God's initial good design for humanity in paradise. So listen, work was not a punishment on humanity. It's not a punishment on you. It's not a consequence even of sin. It's not a curse. It's not even an unfortunate necessity of life. But it's part of our original design. It's a joy, at least in, in the first pages of Genesis. It's a joy, it's a gift, and it's a calling slash commission. So I'm making the case today, listen, uh, working with and for God and his creation, what you do in a variety of ways, in all sorts of different ways, what you do, working with and for God and his creation is our first commission. It's our first commission from God. And even the Great Commission doesn't replace it. It's still our commission to work with and for God. To flesh out what he started, the filling and the forming work. The working it, the taking care of it. But as we close, I want, <laughs> I know there's some cognitive dissonance that's happening, right? Because this pie in the sky view of how great work is, and it's a joy, and we, we love, it's a gift. And you're thinking, not where I work, man. We're getting there. That's what next week is all about. So stay tuned. But today I want you to think about, just a little thinking ahead, how did we end up at that place where work is no longer a gift, where it's no longer a joy? And I want to make the case that it's all about sin, which is why it's important to talk about the gospel every time we're together. I think, obviously, Adam and Eve were supposed to be image bearers. They were supposed to be like God in the way that they ruled. They were supposed to rule and care for and work in the garden. Did that go so well? No. They failed at being an image bearer of God. They failed at their first commission. And that's why all of us, if we're honest about our workplaces, like um, we are part of the problem. <laughs> all of us, there, there's no place maybe beside your family where you can see sinfulness as easily as the workplace and the tragic effects of sinfulness and selfishness. And so it is with great joy that I announce to you that even that doesn't derail the plan of God though. Look at how the book of Hebrews talks about Jesus and the gospel. The son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. What is this getting at? It's like he, he succeeded where Adam failed. He is the true image bearer. He really was the likeness of God, his father. He really ruled uh, in a way that God wanted to be, the world to be ruled. He is the exact representation, the exact perfect image bearer that we failed to be. He succeeded where we failed. And yet what happened to him? This one who sustains all things by his powerful word. The book of Hebrews says, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. You see, this one who succeeded at being an image bearer where we failed, he didn't deserve any of what he got. We deserved it. But what did he get? He died. He died on this cross in our place. Why? To restore to us, among other things, to restore to us the ability and the calling to be that image bearer that we were always supposed to be. He provided purification for us. So every sin you've ever committed in your workplace, every sin you've ever committed in your retirement, in your school, in your family, in your parenting, it's all covered by the blood of Jesus. And now he calls you back onto the playing field, back into the workforce, back into the world, back to your original, your first commission to bear his image and to bear it well. So with all this in mind, I have just two ideas for application for you today. First of all, I just wanna let you know, man, like from me to you, from your pastor to you, I want you to know and experience this over the course of this series. What you do, it matters. And this is like whatever you do matters. As I look out, I'm seeing the professions. I'm seeing doctors. I'm seeing architects. I'm seeing retired folks. I'm seeing people in education. What you do, whatever it is you do, matters because everything 
matters. Listen to how Tim Keller says it. Work has dignity because it's something that God does and because we do it in God's place as his representatives. Farming takes the physical material of soil and seed and produces food. Music takes the physics of sound and rearranges it into something beautiful and thrilling that brings meaning to life. When we take fabric and make a piece of clothing, when we push a broom and clean up a room, when we use technology to harness the forces of electricity, when we take an unformed, naive human mind and teach it a subject, when we teach a couple how to resolve their relational disputes, when we take a simple material and turn it into a poignant work of art, we are continuing God's work of forming, filling, and subduing. There's no sacred and secular. It's not like what I do matters and what you do. You're just earning a living to get by and maybe to tithe and so we can do something that matters. No, what you do matters. And we're gonna see that more and more as this series continues. Uh, the last thing, the last application for us today I just want to propose to you is that you will consider with me redefining your definition of paradise. And I want to propose to you that what we just learned together teaches us this, that paradise is not a vacation, but a vocation. And work is not something to be escaped or even tolerated, but something to be embraced and something that we should find deep meaning and satisfaction in. We're going to talk about how to do that, by the way. I know it's not easy. But but let's get rid of this illusion that life would be great if we just didn't have to work. You know who some of the most miserable people are? People between jobs people who are fresh to retirement and haven't figured out yet that that's not the good life, to do nothing. And there's this phase where retirees have to get back in and find meaning and do things. Let's get rid of that illusion that work's the problem. Work's not the problem. We need work. So as we continue on, let's embrace as the people of God our first commission to partner with and for God in his world.